the volume and turn down the lights. It's time for another episode of True Ghost Stories. I'm Dave Mace, your host and guide for this Outside the Veil podcast. For this episode, we'll be visiting a house on Market Street in San Francisco. Today, the house is a business in a Victorian-style storefront located next to an abandoned theater. It's not often that police are called to investigate the paranormal. In my own law enforcement career, I can only think of one time of being dispatched to a ghostly call. Myself and another officer arrived at a disturbing the peace call in a fairly new neighborhood. The call was vague as to what exactly was going on, but it seemed to have something to do with a noisy neighbor. We knocked on the door and it was opened by an average looking male in his early 30s. He thanked us for coming so fast and invited us in. He led us to the living room, stopped and seemed to be listening for a second, and began to explain why he had called. Okay. I hope you don't end up taking me to the loony bin, he said. But I don't know who else to call. I keep hearing voices, like someone's talking. It's just loud enough I can hear it, but I can't make out what they're saying. At first I thought it was my neighbors, but it even happens when they're not home, so I'm kind of confused. As a police officer, you deal with lots of crazy people, and this guy just didn't fit the mold. He looked as if he had just arrived home from the office wearing slacks and a button-down shirt, wasn't acting irrational or excessively emotional. He was simply at a loss to explain where these voices were coming from, and it bothered him. I asked him if he could hear the voices now, and he said no, and he explained that they had stopped about ten minutes before we arrived. He said they occurred at any time, day or night, and sometimes he would turn up his TV or stereo loud enough so he couldn't hear them. Other times it would be quiet. He said he had moved in several months earlier and it started almost immediately. He checked the house for devices left on, listening to the walls in an attempt to pinpoint the origin and even talk to the neighbors to see if they had similar experiences. His original thought was that it had something to do with the acoustics of the house and the ceiling. But to no avail, he could not find any answers. Most people with similar complaints of disembodied voices will usually attribute them to demons, government spies in the walls, or aliens in their heads. This guy wasn't sure what the logical explanation was, but he had exhausted his ability to investigate it and had called us. The other officer and I looked at each other and kind of shrugged, and we believed the caller was sincere and not hallucinating or crazy, but We had absolutely no suggestions for him. It was probably one of the few times and the last time as a cop I was stumped completely. I had no suggestions for him at all. I told the man that we sympathized with him, but we didn't know what else we could do for him. He said he understood and apologized for calling us out. As the other officer and I walked out to our respective cars, she looked at me and said, That was weird. I just said, yep. We never got any more calls from the house, and a few weeks later, I drove by the house and noticed a for-rent sign in the yard. Apparently, the man had moved away. This story was pretty mild compared to the one I'm about to share with you. For this one, we have to go back in time a bit. This was a strange tale that occurred about two years after the great San Francisco earthquake. In fact, it occurred on New Year's Eve, 1909. Unlike most spooky tales, this one happened in broad daylight. The spirit, or spirits involved, were not the least bit shy either. I'll be retelling this true story adapted from an article printed in the San Francisco Call on January 4th, 1910. Max Barnett, 
Mrs. Taylor living at 2457 Mission Street. He stood with four of San Francisco's finest, two uniformed officers and two detectives, and watched as furniture danced, banged and moved, and even floated about the house. Neighbors gathered as the furniture put on a show for them and others present. Detective Burke and Gallagher tried to apply their best investigative skills to this case, but to no avail. At first, they watched from a distance, since the objects seemed to move around indiscriminately, and they feared injury from the flying and unpredictable objects. Some of the chairs would spin, and even heavy pieces would slide suddenly across the room with little or no effort. Mrs. Barnett was the first to see the strange happenings on Friday around 3 p.m. She was downstairs when she heard unusual noises coming from the upstairs. At first, it was a thumping and banging, but quickly increased in the magnitude to loud crash. She ran up the stairs to investigate and was shocked to see a chair dancing across the floor. No one else was in the upstairs at the time. She couldn't see any cause for the activity, and Mrs. Barnett quickly ran back downstairs and called her husband. Max Barnett arrived about 30 minutes later. He entered the house and immediately began investigating. Upon walking into the back room, he found that all the furniture was in disarray. Chairs were overturned, dressers were out of place, and the beds were unmade. It looked as if a burglar had ransacked the house, but as Mr. Barnett started to straighten up, things again became active. The ghost, or whatever it was, seemed to be intent on keeping things a mess. As he turned a table upright, a pillow jumped to the chair like it was a trained animal. Another pillow stacked itself on top of the first, and a suitcase stacking itself on top of the pillow completed the pile. Bed sheets were ripped from the bed and began doing a dance around the room. It was as if a ghost were doing an impersonation of itself. Not able to take it anymore, Mr. Barnett called the police. The first two officers to arrive were M.H. King and James Drennan, followed closely by the detectives. King had patrolled the neighborhood for several years, but this was his first ghost call. I suspect it was his last as well. After a brief explanation from Mr. Barnett, the officers went to work. Being practical men and the company of other practical men, they acted on experience and ordered whoever was inside to come out. They got no response, but the furniture itself immediately seemed to start being affected. The bed immediately hopped several times in place, causing two framed pictures to fall off the wall. Startled but not deterred, the officers set about straightening up the room, but no sooner had they started that unseen forces again began to turn furniture over. Tables would fall over and chester drawers would twist in place. Despite it being winter, the officers were all having to wipe sweat from their brows. They were quickly understanding that this was not something that they had ever encountered before and had no real resources to address. Perhaps the spookiest thing they saw was the was a large statue of Hiawatha that seemed to walk itself from the dining room to the bathroom, making its way through a melee of other moving objects. Detective Burke was quoted in the paper as saying, I'm a skeptic. But what can a fellow do when he sees such things? Two other skeptics arrived at the house, just in time to be converted. Bert Pratt was a brother-in-law of the Barnetts and was very dismissive of the tales they told him. He barely got the words out of his mouth when a bureau attacked him. Without assistance, it rolled over and smacked him right in the shin. A nephew by the name of Carl Schultz arrived just to make fun of the whole affair, but like Mr. Pratt, he was shocked to see the activity for himself. He saw firsthand the Hiawatha statue making its way across the room, which caused him so much fear he ran from the house. The family felt they had no choice but to move out and 
started packing right away. On Saturday, the next day, as they took their belongings out of the building, a box came hurling over the upstairs banister and came crashing down on the floor below. That seemed to be the ghost's last message. Get out. Don't come back. Don't let the door hit you in the ass. Max Barnett was quoted by the paper as saying, There's a belief that the spook was the spirit of an old year moving out. But why does it have to pick on me? I did a little historical research before this article and found that there was a Max Barnett who was born in and raised a family in San Francisco. I also found several newspaper articles that referred to a Detective Burke and an Officer King. Officer King apparently worked in the Mission District for several years before and after this event. The address is a slight mystery since the one quoted is 2457 Mission Street, but that address does not currently exist. I'm guessing that sometime after this event, the building was either torn down or the street numbers were changed. In 1912, the Tower Theater opened in the same or next to the given address. The address, 2457, apparently did exist at one time, since I located several small ads in the paper for a woman who was looking for work with skills as a seamstress. That ad was placed in 1905. Also, in 1905, a girl by the name of Jeanette Spammer lived at the same address and was listed in the newspaper as the winner of a prize contest that had been going on. I don't know what happened to Ms. Spammer. I can't find any records of her birth or death. Perhaps she fell victim to the San Francisco earthquake, or maybe she just moved away. I could hypothesize, as many ghost hunters do, that she must have died in the building and might be the cause of the strange hauntings. That kind of logic is embarrassing, really. Jump to the absurd based on a single fact. But there are many that claim to be investigators that do just that kind of thing when gaping holes in history don't provide the facts they want. Not only that, but paranormal research has led many in the field to believe that this kind of activity is linked to the living and not a long-dead spirit. Studies have found that there is a link to telekinetic activity and overly active brain often brought about by stress, hormonal changes, and most often puberty. Telekinesis is the ability of the brain to influence inanimate objects to move and basically defy the laws of physics with or without a person's awareness. Fortunately for all of us, this is a rare occurrence and even rarer to the degree of this kind of an event. Keep in mind, though, this is still theory, and as with most paranormal or extrasensory events, it's extremely hard to reproduce. This could mean that scientists are on the right track, or not even close. We only know that these kinds of people, people in puberty or distraught, etc., are usually present when these kinds of events occur. Scientists, being scientists, have to stay within the realm of what they know. But those of us not bound by the rules of the laboratory could argue that spirit may be drawn to these kinds of people and, for whatever reason, take their frustrations out on people's belongings. Of course, for the hardcore non-believer, this is all fabricated and only fools believe such rubbish. The interesting thing is... They are the kinds of people who end up having these kinds of experiences. All I know is San Francisco may have more ghost stories per square mile than any other U.S. city. It's got miles and miles of old homes located in a city with so much wild history you could fill volumes of books. 
And that doesn't even cover all the history that's been lost or kept secret. On top of that, San Francisco still has a very vibrant spirit and life of its own that never seems to rest. Seems like a perfect place to find ghosts to me. I want to thank you for listening to this episode and hope you'll keep coming back for more. If you get a chance, you might want to stop by and visit my website, www.outsidetheveil.com. When you do, I'll be here. You'll be able to find me just outside the veil.